Okay, good. So let's start all over again. Good morning. Well, thank God that we are here this morning and um, we are before the throne of grace to worship. Some of us are here seated and some are joining online. There is nowhere we are that God cannot reach us. So both those that are here and those that are online, we are asking for God's blessings as we worship this morning. May God speak to us. May God reach us. May God touch us as we come before his throne. And that is the throne of grace. Let's bow our heads together as we pray. Gracious Lord, we thank you because we have you and we are proud to be called your children. We have come this morning to worship. I pray, O oh God, that whatever burdens that we carry or whatever things that may want to weigh us down, we lift them before you and ask that you lift them, O oh Lord, and touch us and draw us closer to you. I just want to pray, O oh God, for those that are here seated and those that are online, that you give us a focus on the Lord Jesus Christ, that you touch our hearts in a new way. You speak to us, O oh Lord, and draw us to a place where you want us to be and be thou exalted in everything. All the noise around us, all the cares of the world around us, all the burdens that we carry, O oh God, we believe that they are lifted at Calvary. So as we have come this morning, you will speak to us and speak to our loved ones. Touch them through us, even as we have come before you. Thank you so much, O oh God, as we pray together the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen and amen. You're welcome to worship this morning, and we will have Carolyn give us the call to worship. Good morning. Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. For the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. We begin in the name of the Lord who made us. Let us sing and worship together as we praise God's holy name. Our opening hymn this morning is Great is Thy Faithfulness.
Linda will read our scriptures. Is that right? No. Announcements. Jerry will do announcements. Sorry, I didn't bring my paper with me. My cover? Morning. We welcome everyone back to church service, both in person and through Zoom. I will be begin reading the announcements. To help us have a convenient service for your protection, we posted the list of rules and guidelines. Please register attendance with the ushers. Fellowship Hall and basement are closed. Ushers will seat you and dismiss you. The bathroom behind the elevator is open if necessary. For the bathroom, children need to be accompanied by a parent or adult. Observe social distancing. If you have a compromised immune system, please stay home and watch the service through Zoom. Masks are recommended. The beautiful flowers on the altar are given by Carrie Ransom in honor of her parents and brothers. Your offering can be put into the offering box at the entrance into the narthex. The Nichols for the Orphanage in Nigeria will be at the entrance in the narthex as well. The Missions Committee and Ministerial Association were to host an ice cream social in the park in June for the local EMS, that's police, fire, sheriff's department, and ER staff. Due to COVID-19, we would like to purchase gifts from gift cards from Dairy Queen and Zestos, etc., to present them to the local EMS. If anyone is interested in donating, we will collect the next two weeks and deliver them the last week of July. Thank you. Ed Council will meet on Thursday, July 23rd at 7 p.m. through Zoom. Bernita will send a link, a link this week. Noisy, isn't it? <laughs>
Thank you so much. That's uh, a very nice piece. Thank you, everyone, for coming this morning, and thank you for all of you that joined through Zoom. Let's remind ourselves to come to church because it's so easy uh, during COVID-19 for us just to forget that today is even Sunday because we're not moving as freely. Our routine, routines have been altered because of all of this. So let's make every effort to encourage our families, our friends to either join on Zoom or to come to the church so that we can fellowship together. Um, like it's been announced, I encourage that uh, you, you, can, you check the Alliance United Methodist uh, Friends and Family page on Facebook. Millie Clark uh, posted some of the announcements that have to do with missions committee, especially the EMT, I mean, the EMS um, appreciation. So please check that, and I will encourage, if anyone would want to participate in that, please see her. Another uh, thing that is not read is that we have an opportunity to serve the community table again. Uh, a date has not been picked, but the missions committee is asking for uh, volunteers that will help with this. So either see Millie Clark or... Linda Tucker and talk to them about this so that they can uh, point you in the right direction as it has to do with the community table. We have quite a few prayer points this morning. Uh, Bruce Trussell had back surgery and is having some complication in Lone Tree, Colorado. Let's pray for God's intervention. Kerry Ransom is having carpal tunnel surgery tomorrow. And the same thing with uh, Dorothy Canine is having an MRI uh, on her neck tomorrow. Um, Vicky Cron, let's pray for her for healing from a fall. She kind of, it affected her back, so she's going to have an MRI too to get what is going on. And let's also pray for Rhonda Boga, who is having knee surgery on Tuesday. I want us to pray for Janine Hines. Uh, she's having some health concerns. And let's pray for the family um, uh, who is needing God's guidance and protection. The name is not mentioned, but just pray for a family that needs uh, protection and God's guidance. Let's continue to pray for Sue Hennings and her family, that God will help them as they go through the trials they're going through. And I want us to bow our heads as we pray for the offerings and as we also pray for these items. I will want you to just pray and thank God for one thing, that God has used so many people to keep this church going, even in these difficult times. So many people have volunteered time, their resources, they have volunteered their time to reach out to other people. Let's just thank God for being a family of faith. And let's pray for these needs that we have. Let's bow our heads together. Jesus, Lord, indeed our faith looks up unto thee, even as we thank you for what you're doing in our life as a church. We praise you, O oh God, because you are blessing us in so many different ways. And you're moving so many people to come to you and serve in different ways. Some, O oh Lord, serve you through the resources you've given 
And Lord, that's why we're bringing our offerings to you this morning. Some reach out to other people. We say thank you for their lives. And others are serving in so many different ways that we cannot even see or even mention. I pray for your blessings on each and every one, and may you be glorified. For these people that have different needs, O oh God, as a household of faith, we join our arms and our heads together to pray and ask that may your love encompass them. That in this time of trial, in this time of sickness, Lord, that you would be with them and you will hold them and draw their minds towards you, that they will see that indeed their healing comes from you. I pray, O oh God, for this nation. I pray, O oh God, that you bring healing in this nation, that you will help us, O oh God, to arise and, and be the people that you have called us to be, and that, O oh God, this nation will continue, O oh Lord, to fulfill its place in the global economy, in the global life, in everything that is happening, that the example that you have set this nation to be will never be thwarted by anything or anyone. I pray for the leadership of this country. I pray for your wisdom. I pray, O oh God, for your protection. Shield them, O oh God, from, from being broken by anything. And our Father, O oh God, you take down the glory. I want to pray, O oh Lord, for the elections that are coming in November. Things get heated. But Father, O oh Lord, just like you said to the storm and the waves, peace be still. I pray, O oh God, that your peace will intervene, that your peace will, O oh God, go through the hearts of your children, and you're going to lead this nation to the right decision of all those that will be elected, that, Lord God, the leadership will be that, O oh God, which you will use to accomplish your will and your purpose in this country. Thank you so much for hearing us. And thank you for answered prayers, because we pray everything through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. We're going to sing the hymn, Lord Speak to Me, from 463.
we will have those scriptures read by Linda. Good morning. Our scripture this morning is from Genesis 12:10 and 13:4. Abram in Egypt. Now there was a famine in the land, and Abram went down to Egypt to live there for a while because the famine was severe. As he was about to enter Egypt, he said to his wife Sarah, I know what a beautiful woman you are. When the Egyptians see you, they will say, this is his wife. Then they will kill me, but will let you live. Say you are my sister, so that I will be treated well for your sake, and my life will be spared because of you. When Abram came to Egypt, the Egyptians saw that Sarah was a very beautiful woman and that Pharaoh's officials saw her, they praised her to Pharaoh, and she was taken into his palace. He treated Abram well for her sake, and Abram acquired sheep and cattle, male and female donkeys, male and female servants, and camels. But the Lord inflicted serious diseases on Pharaoh and his household because of Abram's wife, Sarah. So Pharaoh summoned Abram. What have you done to me? He said. Why didn't you tell me she was your wife? Why did you say she's my sister so that I took her to be my wife? And then here, now here is your wife. Take her and go. Then, Sarah gave, then Pharaoh gave orders about Abram to his men and they sent him on his way with his wife and everything he had. So Abram went to the, away from Egypt and to Negev and his wife and everything he had and Lot went with him. Abram had become very wealthy in livestock and in silver and gold. From the Negev he went from, pallet, from place to place until he came to Bethel, to the place between Bethel and Ai where his tent had been earlier and where he had first built an altar. There Abram called on the name of the Lord. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, everyone. I hope I have some children out there in Zoom land, since I don't have any here today. Today, I want to talk about faith. I want to talk about doing things for the first time. So, if you were a child, I want you to think about when you learned how to swim. So, when you learned how to swim for the very first time, it was probably kind of scary. You probably didn't go to the deep end and just jump in and start swimming. You probably went in in the shallow end. Hopefully you had somebody there with you, like um, somebody to teach you to swim, like your parents or a big brother or sister, or even maybe um, uh, somebody at the swimming pool that was teaching you to swim. How about when you went to school for the very first time? That's a very scary time. And when you are in kindergarten, your mom or your dad walk you in. You trust that your parent or whoever comes with you is there to help you and to not make you so scared. So that's faith, making that or having that person there with you, trusting them that they're going to help you. Riding a bike is another time that you would have to have faith in someone that's running along with you, knowing that they're not going to let you fall. Today's Bible story talks about Abram and his wife, Sarah. And God told them to do something that they'd never done before. Told them to go to a land that they'd never been to. And on that journey, Abram, Abram had to have lots of faith. He had to know that God knew where he was going. He had to know that 
God would help him when he needed help and be there when he didn't know where he was going or what he was going to be doing. And on that journey, Abram did have faith for most of the time, but then there was time that he lost faith and he didn't follow God. And when he lost faith and chose not to follow God, then bad things started to happen. So the lesson today in our scripture is that when you are right with God and when you are following God, your path is a lot smoother than when you try to go rogue and when you try to do it on your own. If you're trying to ride a bike for the first time on your own, you would probably crash. But if you have someone there that you trust and you have faith in and they help you, then you probably won't crash. So in our Bible story today, we need to remember that having faith in God and following God is always an easier path than doing it on our own. Let's pray. Father, sometimes we are afraid to go where we have not gone before. Help us to remember that you are with us wherever we go. Amen. You know, those who do children's time for us here, I think I'll just make them to start preaching. That's all about it. <laughs> so thank you so much, Julie, for that wonderful um, message and summary of the message that we are looking at today. You know, Amy Carmichael, an Irish missionary to India, she served 55 years in India without taking a vacation. And she said something that is profound to me in relation to this message this morning. She said, sometimes the enemy comes in like a flood. But then is the time to prove our faith and leave our songs. The enemy comes to us like a flood. But when that happens, that is when our faith needs to be proved. If you want to read about um, Amy Carmichael, she, she said this in her book, Candles in the, Candle in the Dark. It's a very nice reading that you can glean a lot of lessons from it. We continue with our series, What If You Were Tested? And we will examine one of the tests Abraham faced and draw some lessons from this very one uh, test today. In our text, Abraham was confronted with a famine. So, we are looking at the tests that was triggered by a famine. And the test unfolded in different ways. First of all, it was the circumstances of the test. And secondly, the people that were in the test. And finally, the things Abraham acquired from the tests. So let's look at the circumstances of this test in chapter 12 of Genesis verse 10. In Genesis chapter 12, verse 10, we read, Now there was a famine in the land, and Abraham went down to Egypt to live there for a while because the famine was severe. You know, in order to understand the circumstance Abraham was in when he was confronted by this test, we need to remember a few things from the story of Abraham. First of all, Abraham was living in luxury when God called him to leave his people, to leave his land to a place he did not have an idea he was going to. I mean, to a place he did not even know. And secondly, Abraham clearly had God and left his land. And when he arrived at the, I mean, where God was leading him to, he had God again. So he was not just hallucinating. He was not just guessing. He was not in doubt. For sure, God was leading him to go to the land of Canaan. 
So no doubt God was with him. And another thing that we need to understand to grasp this that was going on is that there is no record anywhere that we have read that showed that either in all of the Chaldeans where Abraham left to Haran where he stayed with his father and to the extent of living, I mean, before living to the land of Canaan, we have not read about any experience of famine. He has not experienced that. But now, he was in the land that God promised him. Then that was where he had to find food for a large number of people that were with him, including the livestock. You know, Abraham had a very large family. Later on, as we're going to read in chapter 14, chapter 15 and 16, particularly in chapter 14, you realize that when his nephew Lord was attacked, we are told that he took over 300 trained fighting men that were with him. So, I mean, these were those who were trained that had probably, let me use today's language, that have been in the military like Cocktail, but not like us who have not been in the military, we are not trained. So he took over 300. Imagine how many were left, and women, women and children. So it was a large crowd of people that he was confronted with the challenge of having to feed them. And then the livestock, so it was not just a mere thing that we just read and pass, but it was a dear situation. And the Bible tells us that the famine was severe. And then I, probably it's going around in your mind now, but why did God allow the famine in the land he had promised Abraham? Why would God do that? A land that he was a stranger he didn't, he, I mean, he was not too familiar about that land. God had promised him that land. He was a stranger there, but there it was. A famine came true. You know, one thing I want us to know is that God allows the circumstances of the famine to teach Abraham that, on the one hand, tests or trials often follow triumphs. When we are tested, when we are faced with trials, on the one hand, that can lead us to triumph if we keep trusting God. And then on the other hand, we can learn that tests will often precede a series of failures when we trust in our own wisdom. The famine came so that we can learn these lessons that when we are tested the chances are if we keep following God and trusting him we will triumph and we will grow in our faith so test is not bad for us as Christians but when we fail to trust and follow God the chances are that test precedes a series of failures that can lead us downward until we realize and turn around. God allows different and difficult circumstances to stretch us so that when we stand and face those circumstances, the muscles of our feet will be built up. Because it's like going and exercising, taking a walk, or just doing, moving and doing some motions, that strengthens your muscles. That is what test does for us. That's what trials do for us. When we are faced with tough circumstances in life, God may be wanting to develop our faith and trust in him. The lesson here from the life of Abraham is, don't try to run away when you are confronted with trials. Because these trials, the Bible tells us that we come out of them being refined as gold. 
That's the best version of us comes out when we trust in God and we stay in that test. We stay with God and trust God and depend on him because he will see us through and he will lead us to become a better version of ourselves. You know, instead of Abraham remaining in the land and trusting God to help him, we read in verse 10 that Abraham went down to Egypt. I'm not going to digress here, but let me just give you an imaginary picture when the Bible speaks about Egypt and speaks about the promised land. You know, when you read about people going to Egypt in scriptures, mostly is that they went down to Egypt. But when you read about people going to the promised land, take for instance, going to Jerusalem, the Bible tells us that they went up to Jerusalem. Okay, now, let me ask you this question. Would you prefer to be going down or be going up? <laughs> I mean, every one of us, in normal circumstances and things are going well, we want to go up. But the Bible here tells us that Abraham went down to Egypt. Now, this is the imagery. The imagery of Egypt in the Bible is a symbol of the world system and bondage. Egypt is a depiction of the world system and bondage that people are held in. Read everywhere in scriptures. That is where, I mean, that's the picture we get. Abraham left the land God promised him and went down to the land of bondage and a land that symbolizing the, symbolizes the world system because he doubted God and abandoned his post and ran to the wall for help. The danger of fighting a battle and a soldier abandoning his or her post is enormous because when you abandon your post, you are exposing yourself to danger and you are exposing your company and every other person that depends on you. You are exposing everyone to danger. The principle here I want us to take home is when circumstances become very difficult and you are passing through testing, remain where God has put you until he tells you to move. When you are facing challenges and problems and these circumstances may not be a famine. I mean, some of us cannot even imagine what a famine is especially living in western Nebraska where people believe in work and earning a living. You know, just this past week, I was riding in a combine and I saw how much grain, I mean, how much wheat was actually harvested. And I was wondering, why do we have hungry people? So you may not really understand the language of a famine here. But a famine is... I mean, comes when everything that you think about having food is just gone. You don't even say, I'm going to plant a garden and I'm going to get it. There is no moisture. There is no water. There is nothing to actually water that to have best. That may not be exactly the situation you are facing. The circumstance you may be facing may not be a famine. Your circumstance may be a medical one. Your circumstance may be a social one where things are going very difficult. The circumstances that you are facing may include emotional circumstances whereby you are in a dry land. You just feel so dry and drained. Let me tell you something. What I want us to take note of is when you are passing through these testing and trials, Remain where you are and trust God until he tells you to move. Otherwise, you take decisions, you move without God letting you go or without God leading you, you will make a mistake that will draw other people into it. When you move because of doubt and unbelief, you are moving into a direction of restlessness and fear because that is the point. 
You move into a direction because you are not sure. You are doubting God and you are trying to move. Be careful at that time. That is not the time for you to move until you hear God ask you to move. Because the will of God never leads you to where his grace will never keep you. If God tells you to move in any circumstance, in any problem, or in anything, he asks you to do anything, his grace will go with you. But if you move without him telling you, the result will be as that of Abraham. Abraham failed the tests and turned from the will of God. Well, if you run away from one test, this is the thing. If you run away from one test, you may be getting into a move that is very bad that leads on to other bad moves. That's what happened to Abraham. If you, if you are running away from the circumstances that God, ha I mean, that are going around you, no matter how difficult they are, and it's not God that is leading you, you may be moving into more difficult circumstances. That was what happened to Abraham. That is what happened throughout the history of the children of Israel. One spectacular example is Jonah, when he was running away from God. You know what happened? He ended up in the belly of a whale. You don't want to do that, right? You don't want to spend three days in the tummy of a fish. What? Smelly. <laughs> it's smelly. <laughs> At least if for nothing is smelly, you, you go in there. Well, we will not want there, that to happen. Well, that is the circumstance. Stay where you are and God will keep you true. Now let's look at the people in the famine tests. In Canaan, Abraham only had to deal with the famine. That's when he was, when the famine came, he only had to deal with that. But in Egypt, Abraham had to deal with a proud king, Pharaoh, and his officials. It is something that you need to know that when you are taking a decision away from God, you may be getting into some deeper issues that you may not be able to deal with. Because of his move to Egypt and having a deal with the people, and having to deal with the people there, we noticed several changes that happened in his life. Several things happened. He chose to move outside of God's will. And then we're going to see a lot of things that happen. Number one, Abraham moved from trusting to scheming. He moved from trusting God to scheming his way. Because in chapter 12, verse 11 to 13, listen to what the Bible said. As he was about to enter Egypt, he said to his wife, Sarai, I know what a beautiful woman you are. When the Egyptians see you, they will say, this is my wife. Then they will kill me, but will let you leave. Say you are my sister so that I will be treated well for your sake and my life will be spared because of you. You know, time will not allow me to actually get into the technicality of Abraham's proposal to Sarah. You know, where he presented her as his sister instead of his wife. But one thing for sure is that we know Sarah was his half-sister. Therefore, making a claim that she was his sister, well, yes, that is half-truth. But you know that half-truth is no truth. So that is where the problem lies. Some people will say, yes, but she was his sister. Yeah, but that was not the current status. The current status was she was his wife. And look at what he was doing and what he was saying he was not saying that to uphold the relationship they have as half brother and sister, but he was saying that, and okay, another thing is, he was not saying that so that Sarah could be saved, but he was saying that so that he himself would be saved. 
so it was very selfish. So Abraham moved from trusting to scheming. You know, when you talk about people moving from trusting God, then you find that they will be moving towards trying to scheme their way to protect themselves through situations. But we know that faith is living without scheming. When we trust God, we live without scheming. And when you find yourself scheming in order to escape from problems with people, beware because worse troubles are about to come. You know, sometimes we think we're just wise or we're smart. But we need to be careful. And with Abraham here, he had to begin to do this, to scheme. He thought that would free him. And then the second thing we need to see is that he moved from confidence to fear. From trust to scheming and from confidence to fear. When you are where God has placed you, you don't need to be afraid because faith and fear cannot actually dwell in the same heart. Where a heart where there is faith, fear will not dwell there. If you find yourself constantly afraid and feeling insecure, you need to go back to God and ask him, Lord, I need a little faith, even if it will be just as little as a mustard seed. You know, God had always told Abraham, I will, I will give you the land. I will make you prosperous. I will bless those who bless you. I will, I will. But Abraham moved from the confidence where God tells him, I will, to the fear of the Egyptians. And what he said in verse 12 is very clear. He said, he moved from I will to they will. This is what he said in verse 12. When the Egyptians see you, they will say. Do you hear that? When the Egyptians see you, they will say, this is his wife. And they will kill me. But they will let you leave. Abraham took his eyes off from God and was trusting people. He was looking at people. Sometimes, isn't that what we do? And it becomes a problem. He moved from others to self. Because if you look at it, why was he just thinking of himself? Why was he not thinking of his wife? Why was he putting just himself first? Don't you think that Abraham as a husband should have thought of his wife first? Don't you think that he should have thought of the safety of his wife? Because he's saying, they would see you, that you are beautiful. By the way, Sarah was truly beautiful because she was about 65. And the man was afraid that they would take her away from him. So he was not thinking of Sarah, but he was thinking of himself. When you find yourself thinking of self before others, you need to be careful. Yes, it is good to take care of yourself. But God has called us to be a blessing unto others. That was the call God gave Abraham. That through him, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. But now he was thinking just about himself. And Abraham moved from bringing blessings to bringing judgment. When he got to Egypt, of course, they saw the lady, they saw Sarah, and they recommended her to the king. The king took her to his house. And what happened? The Bible tells us that God descended on Egypt 
he descended on Pharaoh and his household and inflicted pain. If you look at verse 17, you're going to see that. So, when we choose to leave our post and begin to skim and begin to do things, what God has called us to do, we fail to do that. And then we become something else, which will become a problem to other people. And this is where actually I would want to say that, especially to those of us that are men, let's know this, that a husband outside of the will of God can be a lot of trouble to his wife and his household. And that was what Abraham became at this point. But to conclude this, Abraham did not end up there. He repented and returned to God. Because the Bible tells us in chapter 13, verse 1 to 4, that so Abraham went out because the king realized that he was wrong. He sent him out with all the riches and all the blessings that he could give him. Go away. Abraham came out with his wife and Lord. And they went. I want to read particularly verse 3 and 4 of chapter 13. They went to the Negev, and then from the Negev, he went from place to place until he came to Bethel. To the place between Bethel and Ai, where his tent had been earlier. And where he had first built an altar, there Abraham called on the name of the Lord. When you realize that you are outside of God's will, that whatever circumstance you find yourself and you have gone outside of God's will, the biblical principle is go back to where you left him and start afresh. That was what Abraham did. He went to Bethel. Bethel in the Hebrew language is the house of the Lord. This place he had built an altar and he returned and repented. That's what God wants us to do. And that's how we can continue to be a blessing. No matter what the famine is in our lives, no matter what the circumstance is, God is there waiting for us patiently. If there be anything, he invites us to come back to him. And I want us to conclude this message by singing him 593. Here I am, Lord. Oh, Lord. 
bow our heads as we close in prayer. Dear Lord, we come before you. We know that this life is full of trials and struggles. Some of these struggles are with ourselves. Some are with other people. And some are just circumstances of life. I pray thee, O oh God, that you grant us victory as we continue to live for you. And may your glory, O oh God, shine upon us as you lead us to triumph in the trials that come in our ways. When we fail at any time, teach us to go back to meet you, to have a fresh start. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>